want to jump into gravity, what it is and what you've discovered about it, but we're taking a break in about two minutes and I don't want to interrupt you. So allow me to ask you this. I, I, had, I see that you've had conflicting uh, results when you've tried to get your papers published. I think you've had one that was put into the archives, official UK scientific archives, but trying to get something published in a scientific journal has been pretty tough, right? Oh, they absolutely refuse to publish it. You see, I, I'm a member of the Institute of Engineering and Technology as an engineer in the UK. And uh, at first, when I made my discoveries in 2007, uh, it was very s simplified in, in, at that time. Uh, I put, put forward a, a basic model, and I sent it to the Institute of Engineering and Technology, and they said, it's very interesting, but it's not for us to accredit your work or even comment on it, because we, we're clearly... Uh, our remit is within the engineering sector, and although electricity falls into our remit, uh, the atomic level considerations of electricity, magnetism, and gravity should really be directed to the Institute of Physics. So here's the name of the people that you need to talk to at the Institute of Physics in London. So I wrote to them. They ignored me for two months. So I wrote again asking for a reply. They said, we don't publish original material. You'll have to send it to the Institute of Physics Publishing Limited. So they've established a limited company to hide behind the veil of incorporation. This allows these institutes to absolve themselves of all responsibility when it comes to the publication of new, uh, new discoveries, unless the new discoveries fit in with their model of the world as they see it. So uh, I sent the paper to the Institute of Physics Publishing. They refused to publish it, giving three reasons in writing. They said, we're not going to publish it for three reasons. The first reason is, it is completely new. The re <laughs> the you would think that it's completely new is a good reason to publish it, not exactly. to withhold it. Exactly. Hold on, Maurice, we need to take a short break. Our Cotterell, you uh, say in your new book, Future Science, that you have figured out uh, some of the biggest unanswered questions in physics, and probably the biggest of all deals with gravity. What is it that you seem to know about gravity that science doesn't understand or hasn't to this point? Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's a good <laughs> big softball question, right? I'll take a deep breath, George. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, clearly, a lot of brains have been thinking about the problem of gravity for many, many years. So my, the way I looked at the problem was the answer or solution to the problem of understanding gravity has nothing to do with intelligence or brains, because if it had, then we would have figured it out by now. So clearly we had to look at the problem from a different way, at least I, I decided I'd look at the problem. from. A, I think differently, George, that's the first thing. After decoding the treasures of the ancients, you start to look at life differently. And uh, instead of looking at what's there, I've taught myself to look at what's not there. So when I uh, was confronted with the question of gravity, it's not what... Uh, how it could work, I decided to go back and have a look what we don't understand in the field of physics. And as I say in the introduction to the book, I, I actually list them as the 12 great mysteries of physics. And uh, the first one is that, uh, and, and it's very, very simple, I must mention to everybody listening, that there's, um, uh, just let me go back, George, to the three reasons the Institute sure. of Physics sure. refused to publish my paper on gravity. The first one was because it was completely new. That was one of the reasons. <laughs> the second one was there was no mathematics, and it seems that mathematics has taken over physics, and it seems to me that the mathematical tail is wagging the physics dog. The third uh, reason was because there was nothing in it uh, that they were involved in. Now, uh, when I had a look, look at uh, what they really understood about physics and what they try to, they try, they try to persuade us that they're intelligent, that they're learned, that they have all of the answers to everything. When we start to dig deep, they have none of the answers to everything. And if we go back to the, for example, the atom, uh, if you, atoms are made of positive charges in the middle and negative charges which orbit them like uh, mini solar systems. And we figured this out, or Ernest Rutherford figured it out in the 1920s. Two of the questions about the atom, or the main question is, why is the atom stable? And the question arises because if we have positive charges in the middle of an atom, why don't they just spring apart? Nobody knows why the positives don't repel each other and spring apart. The second question is, if negative charges orbit 
the positive charges, why aren't they sucked into the middle? Because negative attracts positive. There are other questions, for example, why do the uh, electrons, the negative charges, orbit the atom in eight different shells, and why are there certain numbers of electrons in certain number of shells? For example, in the, in the orbit closest to the atom, you only ever get to the next orbit, which is further out, uh, you get a maximum of eight, and so on. And nobody knows the answers to any of those four fundamental questions. Another question is, why are the orbital shells offset by up to 45 degrees each? Nobody knows. It's not just gravity they don't understand, but how on earth can you understand how two particles made of atoms could attract themselves if you don't understand how the particles are made anyway? Well, I thought that was one of the most uh, interesting parts of the book, is that you were saying the particle physicists are just dead wrong on several levels. I, I'm sure that's going to be really popular with them, that these particles that they've been telling us about, that they supposedly have seen, may or may not even be there. They're not even there, and I show in the book where they've gone wrong, how they've got wrong, and how they've misled themselves. They've just they've just led themselves up the garden path and finished up in a cul-de-sac which goes nowhere. What we find is, is every good discovery leads on to another good discovery. This, it, that's one of the laws of the universe. Bad discoveries lead nowhere. And that's why we find since 1925, physics has got nowhere. And, you know, we don't even understand how a fridge magnet works. You put a magnet on the fridge, and, you know, these people have the temerity, because it seems to work by magic, they called it a magnet, M-A-G-N-E-T, because it's <laughs> magic to them. Now, pe people listening to this show don't... They've never heard this before. Nobody's ever sat down and said, well, hang on a minute. These people don't know what they're talking about. When you switch on the light at home, physicists don't know why, when a current flows, a magnetic field appears around a wire. They have no idea. They don't understand why stars cluster into bunches in the sky or why, we get, why they have a double spiral, uh, a double... Uh, uh, why galaxies have got a double spiral in them. They don't understand how the sunspot cycle works, how it's generated, what causes it, and they don't clearly don't understand what causes global warming and global cooling. Now, in the book, all of these things are explained step by step in an easy way with no mathematics, using common sense, going back right back to basics in the 1920s. The real problem where science went wrong was in the 1930s. In attempting to answer the first fundamental question of why the protons don't just spring apart in the middle of an atom, where you've got an atom, just let me explain to people who are not familiar with protons and electrons, basically what Rutherford discovered in the 1920s was that every single material on Earth is made up of positive charges and negative charges. The only difference is some have more positives and some have less positives. And they always have, or generally speaking, they have as many positives as negatives. So each atom is balanced generally, but there are exceptions. Now, in trying to answer this question of why don't, say, if you have an atom with, say, 20 positive charges in the middle, for example, calcium, why don't they spring apart? And this is where it really went bananas. In 1935, a researcher called Yukawa said, well, although the positive should re repel a positive, maybe they're covered in glue and they're glued together. In other words, when the Big Bang happened and the universe began, perhaps the glue forced them together, so although they would like to spring apart, the glue is holding them together. So they said, that's a good idea, let's call them gluons. <laughs> so that's what they called them, gluons. So they started to look for gluons. So another guy came along, he said, you know, uh, Yukawa, there's a slight problem with that, because if you've got, say, 20 positives in the middle, like calcium, some of them must have, there must be two types of glue, for example, it must be like Velcro, where you've got a hook side and a velvet side. And the problem is, if you've got two hook sides touching each other, they won't be glued together. And if you finish up with a couple of velvet ones touching each other, they wouldn't be glued together, so it doesn't really answer the question or, the, or solve the problem. So another guy came along and he said, well, that even wouldn't work. Even if you had a hook side of Velcro and a velvet side of Velcro, that wouldn't work because you'd need three kinds of hook sides and three kinds of velvet sides.
So another guy came along, and he said, but that wouldn't work. You'd need three of each of the three types that make up the two types. And since 1935, they've been looking for 300 different types of glue and particles. Even the Oxford Science Dictionary says this, the whole elaborate theory is circumstantial. None of the smaller particles have ever been identified in experiments. The theory does not claim to have been verified. Now, that's not my words. That's the scientific view. So clearly, I had to start at the beginning. I had to go back and answer, what is the atom made of? How is it made? Why don't the bits spring apart and fly out all over the place? And once I'd put a mechanism together, I could understand... Uh, how the atom really is constructed, how it's made. Then I had to look at uh, what kind of uh, attractive force atoms could be giving off to draw them to, to, to each other. And once I'd got the two halves of the equation, if you like, so to speak, I was then able to understand how the radiation that atoms emit draws neighboring atoms together. And then the answer to gravity was simply apparent there was, it was so simple. Once you break it down and start solving each part of the puzzle, one piece at a time, it's easy. But if you're going to accept what's gone before, what you learned at college, then your head's going to get filled full of nonsense, and you won't have a chance of figuring these things out. Talk to me about gravity then, what you understand about it, and, and, and in practical terms, what that means for the world, having a better understanding of gravity, what it means for our ability to, to harness it or, or use it. Okay, what, what I've discovered is that every atom uh, radiates gravity waves, and these, these gravity waves are the same as radio waves, but they're very high frequency. And uh, they're slightly different to radio waves. R a radio wave, if you like... Uh, is electromagnetic energy the same as a gravity wave but uh, radio waves we know are they come in uh, ele an electric wave which is vertical it leaves the antenna vertically and uh, and travels to your antenna on your radio vertically and you have a magnetic wave which travels horizontally which leaves the transmitter and travels through space and impinges upon the antenna on your radio horizontally so you've got a, a 90 degrees shift between the uh, electrical wave and the magnetic wave. That's just ordinary radio waves, nothing special about those. They're all the same. The, uh, I had to figure out what kind of a wave would attract a, a, a an atom, a piece of matter. And it seemed to me that the only, or not the only, but the only way I could figure out that could happen was to look at the mechanism of an Archimedes screw, which was a, a, mo a pump designed by Archimedes about uh, minus 280 BC. And basically, it's a screw thread inside a tube. And if you put this tube into the water and turn the tube with a handle, like a, a starting handle on a car, then what happens is water goes up the screw thread and it comes out onto the riverbank. So I d decided that if atoms gave off radiation, which was like a screw thread, they might be able to draw neighboring atoms towards themselves. So that was the basic premise. And I started to look for any mechanism that could show that atoms do actually radiate corkscrew-style energy. And I, it didn't take me long at all. Once I'd got this idea into my head, I then looked at the hydrogen atom to see how the electron orbits the single proton. And I realized that <clears throat> another one of the mysteries of uh, science is that Physicists don't understand why electrons spin uh, as they orbit atoms. So what I realized was as the electron spins, it radiates uh, this corkscrew-style energy. That corkscrew-style energy pulls neighboring atoms towards itself. And uh, clearly, the gra there's, a, there's a few things here when we're looking for gravity because it's, clearly it's not obvious. If it was obvious, it would have been discovered before today uh, and it's th there are several steps to the gravitational mechanism I figured out how gravity must work in, in 2007 that took me about six weeks just put a basic mechanism together then I gave a, a, a lecture at the UFO conference in Nevada and really I should have called the, the, the lecture how gravity should work or how gravity must work in fact at that time I called it how gravity works it was